it all kind of starts off with a little bit of premise. Anybody know Pete Seeger in here, kind of famous folk singer, uh, has, a, has a song called If I Had a Hammer. And so the premise of this talk was, well, you know, when you're a search vendor, you know, or when you, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? And so as a search vendor, right, everything looks like search, or at least a lot of the things that we do look like search. And so if, if you take and apply that principle to your own development processes, what does this start to look like, right? How can we leverage search, solar, fusion, all of this good stuff to make ourselves better developers, help managers better understand what's going on in our code and all of that good stuff, bring in you know, uh, bugs and, and, and code analysis, et cetera. So that's kind of the, the general principle behind uh, this talk. I'm going to give a couple of demos throughout, but also talk about just some of the things we do. Now, first off, uh, as any good uh, uh, vendor will tell you, the actual dog fooding of your own stuff is, is the, the thing you do last, right? Because you're always so busy trying to get sales and all that kind of stuff. So we do have a little bit of cobbler shoes here, if you're familiar with that, that phrasing. Uh, when I first sat down to write this uh, uh, proposal nine months ago, I said, oh, of course, I'll have this all done and ready and working. Uh, by the time we have the, uh, uh, we have the conference. Uh, truth be told is, uh, you know, I have some of it in place. What I'm going to do is show you some abstractions of what we have and talk about some of these things at a higher level, show you some demos around it. Um, but this is still a work in progress for us as well. So uh, keep that in mind. A little bit about uh, kind of us underneath the hood if you will. I imagine like most shops, uh, you know, we've got a mixture of languages uh, we've got a mixture of tools. So we're primarily, obviously, Solar is a Java platform. We're primarily uh, a Java shop. Obviously, on the front end, it's you know, the flavor of the week JavaScript uh, uh, framework. In our particular case, it's Angular. Those guys are all going nuts right now debating Angular 1 versus 2 and React and all of that. Uh, a lot of our test framework is Python and uh, uh, we have a little bit of closure in what we call our proxy layer. Uh, and I actually, I forgot, now that we integrate Spark, we have Scala in there as well. So it tends to be JVM languages on the back end, uh, and then Python for testing, and then obviously the front end. Uh, tooling, internal tools, pretty common. Gradle for build and you know, the, all of the stuff that comes with Gradle, uh, which has been an interesting ride for us, but it works and, and gets us a reliable, good build. Uh, Jira for bug tracking, uh, although I'm really looking at other options there too. Uh, the big benefit for us for Jira is since Apache and Solar as open source projects use Jira, it's a pretty logical extension for us as well. But at times I feel like it's really heavy. Uh, so it, it all kind of depends on your view. GitHub is where we do all of our code. A lot of uh, branches and pull requests and kind of standard GitHub workflows. Uh, on the kind of the integration suite of how we build Fusion, primarily powered by Jenkins, and then pretty much everything in Jenkins launches Docker containers, which launch Fusion, which launch our launches, things like databases and Mongo and Hadoop and all of that stuff. It's all containerized for the most part. It's either in containers or we do have for things like SharePoint and stuff like that, we have VMs because they don't containerize very well. And then for uh, our team, we're huge Slack users. Uh, Slack really was, in a lot of ways, a game changer for us in terms of communication. We're a really globally distributed team, and so Slack made a big difference for us. We have lots of integrations into Slack. We've written bots that integrate things like GitHub and Jira notifications and stuff like that and bring them in to our Slack uh, messages. I've actually published some of those open source on the testing side, uh, not to, you know, pretty standard stuff there. Um, the interesting thing, obviously, the name Fusion implies we bring together lots of different open sources uh, uh, libraries. The two main ones, obviously, being Solar, which we contribute very heavily to, but then we're also pretty big users of Spark. And then, like I think any modern day shop, you have a whole bunch of other downstream dependencies. I just went through an IP review with our lawyers uh, as part of some due diligence and something like, I don't know, I sat and stared at license files for, for a good day, just working through like all of, is this really GPL or is it LGPL? Is it, you know, and 
And so that's a, that's a whole lot of fun. And in fact, I think with Fusion, I'm going to do some things to help automate that. Uh, we run mostly in uh, Agile shop, uh, roughly two-week sprints, all that kind of stuff. Uh, although, interestingly enough, because of the way the open source community works, we have kind of this out-of-band development. So one part of, uh, out of the four teams that I have underneath me in engineering, one of those teams is kind of in this out-of-band open source model where, you know, let's face it, it's herding cats. And so what we have to do as a, as a company is kind of figure out where are we putting our investments. We roughly put that team on a monthly theme-based approach of here's where we're doing. Are we doing heavy community investments? Are we doing heavy customer investments? Are we doing heavy fusion investments? And so how do we balance those kinds of things? Uh, the rest of the teams, though, pretty much do two-week sprints. And, you know, it's moderately good. One of the things I think that's interesting is how can you help yourself improve. Uh, last but not least, about 40 people globally distributed. Uh, I think there for a little while I had... Uh, I was joking that for April Fool's Day this year, I was going to put out an ad for a developer in Antarctica because I had all six other continents covered, and it would be good to have one in Antarctica. Uh, so those present challenges. As a manager, uh, you know, it's been really interesting. If anybody's made the leap from being a developer to being a manager, you can probably appreciate you know, you, you have this really well-defined thing as a developer where you know your code and your craft and your language and you work to improve, and then all of a sudden you start wearing this managerial hat. And it's all about things like reports and dashboards and developer productivity and quality of product and all of this kind of stuff. I see some people nodding. Um, and then, you know, I also wear the CTO hat where I'm still trying to write some code as well because I don't want to let go of that thing that, that I still really like to do. So... Uh, it's been an interesting ride, but I think, you know, one of the things that I keep coming across is that we've got all these different data sources, right? And I have to jump all over the place to see what's going on, right? And so I want to have something that brings all of that stuff together. And so, you know, in many ways, again, you step back and you say, oh, well, this is what we're trying to build as a product, right? This is what we're trying to sell all of you guys, right? And so if we can't solve this problem for ourselves, then why would you want to buy it for us, right? And if you think about it, this source code stuff and all of that development process fundamentally fits with the same information knowledge problem of you've got a lot of different disparate data sources and you need to figure out what's important in that data. And at the end of the day, you know, if, if, if you've heard me talk before, you hear me talk a lot about how search has gone way beyond just keyword matching is really what you have at your fingertips is this incredibly powerful ranking engine. And that ranking engine is designed first and foremost to help you figure out what's important. Right? And I think that's what fundamentally differentiates search-based technology from traditional RDBMSs and, and kind of the BI space where it's all about roll-ups and aggregations, right? You're fundamentally asking this engine to say, here's a ranked set of results that we think are most important, right? And so you can go and apply those across, uh, uh, across all of these data sources that you use internally. As you can see by the architecture here, uh, the bottom parts of Fusion here are all like connectors. How do we get data sources in? We massage that ETL kind of standard content coming in. Solar and Spark are our two workhorses. Solar, I think of as storage and retrieval, i.e., can I ask questions? Can I store data? And then Spark is essentially large scale distributed computation. That allows me to do whole analysis of all of my index. This is where we do things like signal processing. It's where we're gonna, we do things like large, building large machine learning models, all of that kind of stuff. And then on top of it, you know, put in security, put in APIs, and put a pretty UI up on the top, and you have uh, a good view of kind of how all of this stuff works, right? Because at the end of the day, what our goal as a company with Fusion is, is to ask more interesting questions of solar. We want to give you all the capabilities of solar. You can do all the queries you know how to do, but you then can say, oh, hey, if I want to do recommendations, I'm just going to turn this little thing on, and it's going to start asking solar for recommendations, right? Uh, not to put the two up necessarily against each other so much as to show you like as a complementary capability, 
you know, solar obviously provides that core search and faceting capability. I apologize for the resolution there a little bit. Again, it's that storage and retrieval engine. It's like, how do I ask questions, right? But there's a whole lot of other things that go into building out applications these days. Things like alerting, connectors, ETL, recommenders, admin, so on and so forth. So obviously, as any good vendor, I have my, my checkbox for our product has all the checks. Underneath the hood, this is a little bit more of an engineering architecture. Uh, all of this stuff deploys just like solar deploys. So if you're used to deploying solar, you're used to deploying fusion. So Zookeeper, for all of the goodness that Zookeeper brings in terms of consistency and, and data quality and all that kind of stuff. Solar Cloud on by default, just add nodes, all that good stuff. And then Spark, if you heard Tim Potter's talk yesterday, all that work he does on Spark and Solar with the RDDs and, and basically how do you connect Spark to Solar to do these large scale computations. That all works there. And then we add uh, a whole slew of service, uh, uh, stateless services that again deploy just like Solar, same containers, basically same startup scripts load balance, fault tolerant, all of that kind of stuff. And then in front of that, this is where our closure comes in. We uh, have a, a load balancing proxy and then UI and all of that good stuff. So that's Fusion in a nutshell. Getting in then to thinking about how does all of this stuff start to deploy and look. We started off, uh, probably about a year or two ago of, of doing some simple things. So Fusion's been on the market for about a year. Uh, one of the things that, a couple of things that it have, we have in there is uh, whenever you download, of course, that generates uh, you know, marketing information. So we take that marketing information and for instance, this is a, a light dashboard that shows us all of the platforms from you know, the user agents and you know, what, what browsers you're downloading from and where you're downloading from and all of those kinds of things, right? And so we can take and operationalize all of our marketing stats into Fusion and put them up in uh, dashboards via, via the built-in dashboards. Uh, more recently, we've been doing a lot more work. We added uh, this past year support for Jira, GitHub, Slack, and a few other connectors so that we could start to bring in those uh, data sources. And so now we have this ability to do things like code search, um, we also have in the uh, product a really lightweight uh, heartbeat that says, you know, sends us, you know, aggregation stats. It's not sending any uh, personalized stuff and it's uh, opt-in or opt-out. I forget which one it is. But if you have it on, then we get back, you know, the, the standard like error code kinds of stuff that at the very high level that, that gives us information about how the product is performing. So. Um, all of those things fit very well into this basic search. So with that, just going to uh, give you a quick little demo. I'll give you some pointers at the end where you can go try some of this stuff out uh, yourself. And uh, uh, hoping the demo gods are going to be happy for me here because as always, live demos are always fun. So this is the, the Fusion admin interface. I'm just gonna log in. What I've done is set up uh, uh, just one simple collection I call code search. I've published a GitHub project for this, so you can go and try it and download it yourself later. Uh, as you can maybe see, let me make that a little bit bigger. Or maybe not. Uh, up at the top, what we show you, obviously solar is multi-tenanted, so this is just showing a view of all of solar's collections and cores or whatever you want to call them these days. And then underneath the hood, we have a whole bunch of system collections. So one of the things we do with Fusion is just install around solar. So your core catalog, we can just point Fusion at it, and Fusion looks just like solar, and you can interact with it and get advantages of all these things without actually having to touch your core catalog. So it's a great way to get started with Fusion without having to mess with your core solar. But as you can see, we have a bunch of system collection stuff that will feed into parts of what we're doing here. So things like all of your logs go in there. But at its core there, I've got a top level uh, collection. That's one of my main uh, tenants, and that's got uh, roughly 460,000 documents in it. Underneath the hood in this, there's actually a couple of related collections that are per that one that we also create 
by default. You can turn them off if you want. Uh, the logs themselves, and then a couple of different signals collections, which are where we store information about the signals. Because again, one of the things we want to do is simplify that gathering and, and usage of signals, which uh, uh, if you haven't heard me pontificate on yet, is you know, a really critical part to uh, relevance these days. So jumping in here, uh, let me just zoom back out, if I can get that working. Uh, we have a basic search user interface in here, really designed for internal use. This is obviously not something you're going to put out in front of customers, but designed, and we're building off of this theme of helping you edit and develop your search and seeing the results live in there. So uh, I know that's a little bit hard to read, um, but you can see I've got uh, things like Slack messages in here. I've got uh, uh, a lot of Slack. There's some Jira and so on, and I can come in here and do basic code search things, for instance, if I want to see all of the uh, mentions of assert equals, because for instance, uh, I can't type. Um, this is always the problem of, yeah, it's the problem of not mirroring. And we will add uh, spell checking in there. But see, now you can see, for instance, I've got Jira matches, and I've also got GitHub matches, and, and uh, there's probably some Slack messages in there. And I'll show you here in a minute some of the power of the pipelines as we start to look and slice and dice this data. But you get a basic sense of the search capabilities. And obviously, we could do a lot more in terms of actually, and what we're working on is internal dashboards and all of that. that take away this basic capability here. But you can see I can do boosts and blocks on this stuff. I can set up and tune relevancy, all of that kind of stuff. So that is a quick tour. Um, there's other things in here real quick up here in applications. Things like schedulers, access control. Uh, underneath the hood, we have some system capabilities here where you can, for instance, uh, go and manage your solar clusters. So if you want to point at a new solar cluster, you can just go and do that, and it's up and running. So just a quick tour. Uh, we'll come back to this and look at some other things that we can do. So let me just switch back to slides now. And of course, it starts at the beginning. Makes sense so far? So pretty straightforward stuff, right? Where it starts to get interesting, I think, is when you think about, um, one, you've got all these disparate data sources, and yet they have this kind of semantic linkage between them, right? So like in Slack, our users or our, my developers are constantly saying, hey, could you look at JIRA number X? Could you look at this pull request in GitHub? Could you do the, you know, this? And then likewise, in GitHub or in Jira, we're often linking to Slack and saying, hey, here's the message thread that describes this bug as reference for when you're looking into this bug. Or in GitHub, you have pull requests and say that, that reference, for instance, Jira issues and all of those kinds of things. And then, uh, for instance, in our upcoming release, we're going to have Zendesk support, which is what, you know, if you guys log a ticket with us, for instance, that goes into Zendesk behind the scenes. Uh, there's APIs for, available for that, and so now we can index all of those tickets as well. And so now when the tickets, for instance, are often linked into JIRA as well, because if support needs to escalate to engineering, they'll link it into JIRA, right? And so now I want to be able to see how all of these things go across the stack. Uh, so obviously connectors are a huge part of this. Second, uh, what Fusion brings in is a lot of, uh, of capabilities around per document analysis, what we call pipelines. These sit in front of solar. And the reason why we did that is because these things often you want to scale them independently of solar because almost always the case when indexing your actual document analysis pipeline stuff is something that you want to scale independently of asking the core search engine. Solar has some similar pipeline capabilities underneath the hood. Uh, I think you'll see they're not quite as flexible, but they can be useful here as well. 
uh, things like the update processor chain and, and all of that. So you can still use all of those things, but our pipelines allow you to hot deploy these, hot swap them, move them around, scale them independently, et cetera. And then uh, last but not least, where I think it starts to get really interesting is we've got this distributed compute engine in there that allows you to do things like statistical analysis, machine learning models, et cetera, right? And so you can take and look at all of the things around your code, look at things in the aggregate, and uh, uh, find out information about that stuff. Other things underneath the hood, we have a whole alerting framework. This is not just about having standing saved queries, but it's actually about routing your uh, alerts into the system. These plug right into the pipelines. You can send messages to pager duty. You can send email. You can try things out with logging, stuff like that. Uh, we ship Kibana built in, all secured, all of that kind of stuff. We actually ship some out of the box dashboards as well for reporting on things like zero result queries, stuff like that. Last but not least, uh, lots of security brought in as well. So depending on who has access to what projects, et cetera, we can index and filter on those security tokens, right? So where does this start to get interesting? Um, when you start to think about this, actually, this whole genesis actually started with a customer who said to me, just as an offhand comment, uh, you know, I was thinking about indexing our code and actually looking for places where my devs have forgotten to put proper headers or proper config uh, uh, variables in the code itself. And so they knew as a company that that always caused downstream problems. One, the header stuff obviously for legal reasons or whatever, uh, or just for standard configurations. Things like the uh, uh, making sure whatever required configurations, things like making sure there was no plain text passwords in any of their config files, et cetera. And you start to think, oh, well, that's an ETL process, right? And wouldn't it be great as a manager if you could just go in and, and do searches and see facets and all of that stuff on those things as you're looking at your code base? And so you kind of have this, you know, we all know we're not perfect at this stuff, but you could have this kind of rolling view forward of this stuff. And so that then led me to start thinking about, well, I also could start to bring in things like team and developer, uh, commit bugs, you know, de dealing with commits and bug metrics. I could start to do trends and hotspots. We could bring in things like all of that legal analysis around what licenses are used, right? And now all of a sudden you have the, all of these different data sources that you want to bring in. So as a flavor of that, I'm just going to switch to uh, uh, back to another demo. And we'll bring in a few more of these uh, particular use cases. So I'm going to go back here, uh, go back into the code search. Um, what we've tried to do with the UI here is uh, make it look and feel a little bit like a developer's IDE, right? So over on the, uh, up here on the left, you can essentially set up these different panels that allow you to manage things like your data sources. Uh, so just for the sake of this uh, uh, screen size, you can see, for instance, uh, I've got three or four different data sources set up. And I'll actually show you what the JSON here looks like uh, perhaps in a minute. Um, but for instance, I've got uh, one of these is looking at one of, our, uh, one of my public data sources. This is actually, um, um, I can't see there very well, this is actually using one of our, our GitHub connector and connecting to one of my uh, public uh, repositories. I think it's my Slack Jira integration. Uh, sorry about that. Right? And so I can, I can uh, uh, set off and I can kick off the crawl of that. I can do the same with Jira. I'm not going to do it because I'm, on, I'm not even on the Wi-Fi right at the moment. But you can see over here now, I've got, this is where all of those search results came in, right? So that's kind of what the connectors look like. And then uh, going back, we have two different types of pipelines. One is the index side and one is the query side. Just to show you real quick on the index side, the main pipeline, my, pipeline I'm using is this, uh, uh, what we call our source code pipeline. And then what I've done is I've modified that pipeline a little bit to do some things that I thought were perhaps interesting. Uh, so the way these things work is you can go in and you just get a drop down here of the pipeline stages. You select one of those pipelines and then uh, 
uh, go ahead and configure it, right? I'm not going to do that here, but so for instance, this is our Tika pipeline parser, and you have various options for how you want to deal with things like images in Tika and all this stuff that you would have to code up. That's all in there, out of the box. And I can do things like have it conditionally fire if I want. I can have it easily turn it on or off, all of those kinds of things. Some of the other things I've done in this particular one, I've got a, a regular expression extractor. This is where it starts to get interesting in terms of how do we start to link together these different data sources so that I can bring them together all into one. So all I did was set up a little regex pattern here that looks in certain fields in the content. And then it looks for, uh, and we're working on making these uh, a little bit more readable here, but I have a regular expression that just looks for JIRA ID. So if you know JIRA, it has this pattern of project name dash JIRA number. And so then all I do is I look in these source fields of content and the commit messages. Just as an example, there's obviously other places this could be. Uh, and then if it finds a match, it's going to output it to a field called JIRA mentions, right? So the interesting thing here is this content field, that's from the JIRA documents. This commit messages is from the GitHub messages. And so I could add in various other ones there as well, right? And so what then happens is you're able to get things like this facet field over here that says JIRA mentions, and I'll come back to the rest of the pivot here. But <laughs> so for instance, you can see in this source, uh, in, our, in all of this integration data, there's 285 mentions of uh, JIRA focus 3449. So as a manager, I'm thinking, well, geez, why is that thing such a hot topic, right? You know, why are so many people in this particular case, why are they talking about Focus uh, 3449? Focus was our internal code name for our previous product called LucidWorks Search. And so on down the, the, the uh, line here, Apollo is actually our internal code name for, the, for Fusion or parts of Fusion. So I can see, you know, this Apollo 2691, you know, standard kinds of faceting thing that's going on here, right? Other things that you can do is turn on uh, data normalization, so field mapping, kind of standard things that you do as you try to normalize your data. And then I've got a little bit of JavaScript here also, uh, just as an example. Let me scroll down there. That looks at the incoming content from GitHub, for instance, and, and uh, I can make that a little bit bigger. Not so much to see the actual code. It's all checked in. But GitHub has certain patterns in its URLs, and then I wanted to add fields that say what type of content is this from GitHub. So for instance, uh, slash commit, I just mark as a source type of commit. And then that allows me to look at all of the different ways people are interacting with GitHub, right? And then finally, we just output to solar. You can actually plug in other things into the pipeline. We publish an SDK so you can write your own. So that's the index pipeline side. We ship with a number of other ones out of the box. We also have query pipelines, just like uh, the index side. These allow you to modify the search requests as they're coming in. Uh, and so the default hit one here is doing things like I set up, uh, I set up, for instance, pivot fastening. So these are kind of standard solar query parameters. But there's also other things in here. So for instance, if you want to set up recommendations, that's just a click away. If you want to send a pager duty message as an alert, that's just a click away. You can plug in your own JavaScript. You can uh, call out to databases. You can make sub calls to solar. So like if you want to do multiple calls to solar, you can go ahead and do that. So as a simple pipeline on the query side, what I've got set up is uh, just simply log a message. All that does is just, it's like a way of testing the alerting without actually sending out an email or sending out a pager duty. Uh, and what I did is it has like this templated response. I just set up very simple parameters here that say things like, hey, here's a query, and then uh, a little bit of uh, uh, what's called the string template library that allows you to essentially pop in variables into your into your content, and so it will just print out in the logs, here's a query, right? Um, so all of that then works to produce 
this over here. So for instance, uh, pivot fastening, what I did there was actually pivot between the JIRA mentions and the data source they're coming from. So in this particular one, this focus 3449, all of the mentions of that JIRA were in, uh, uh, or all of that, the mentions of that JIRA ticket were in JIRA itself, whereas in this one from Apollo, Actually, a good chunk of the conversation was on Slack, and some of it was on Jira, right? So kind of standard solar faceting type things that you can do there. But the important thing is, like, I can just go and change these in the pipelines, and you'll see them change live, right? And I've got a few other things in here, like looking at channels, uh, looking at Jira mentions map to users. So for instance, uh, another, uh, another set of pivots there. You can see on this particular issue, uh, a guy named Ganesh and a guy named Matt probably had the large majority of the conversation there. And so you start to then get a sense of who's talking about what, and you can then, of course, go and do things like put this stuff into, uh, uh, into Silk or into Kibana, if you will. I'm having a little bit of an issue here, but um, you, know, you can go and, and visualize this kind of stuff. For some reason, my event counts aren't showing up right at the moment. But, um, you know, so you can see kind of how this stuff is trending over time and all of that kind of stuff. Okay. So that's the kind of rough stuff in, or the, you know, rough outline of the indexing pipelines and the query pipelines in a nutshell. The last part of this is uh, looking at things like whole code analysis. Um, and so what we've, I've got set up here, let me get back to uh, my pipelines here uh, and aggregations. I've just set up a very simple aggregation. I'll actually show you. I think this looks better in JSON, which I think fits better with the developer mindset anyways. Um, but you can see in here what an aggregation allows you to do is basically the way aggregations work is you start off with a solar query. That defines a document set that you want to go do aggregations on. right? And you can say whatever fields. And these aggregations can be across your main catalog. They can be across your signals, basically whatever collection you want to use, right? So I've got this filter query essentially that I start things off with, and then I have different ways of slicing and dicing that data. So in this particular one, all I'm going to do is, uh, if you look at the commit data from GitHub, you actually get a length of what the patch size is. So you could ask the question, what is the average length of patches by author, right? Maybe useful, maybe not. Uh, maybe it's a measure of developer productivity. Probably not, but something that's easy to demo, explains the concepts. Uh, let me just bring over Postman here, because uh, I think this shows what this stuff looks like a little better. So if you go and check out the GitHub project, there's a Postman file. If you don't use Postman for testing your REST APIs, please start. Really great, really easy to share things. I've got all the setup of all the collections and the data sources. Um, and the uh, pipelines, don't worry, there's ways to abstract out the, um, the passwords and all of that stuff. So I'm hoping I caught all of them and you'll just see variable substitutions in there. Uh, but one of the things that we have in here is uh, a list of all of our aggregations or looking at the aggregations API. So you can see built into Fusion, there's a whole bunch of aggregations already. We actually dog food all of our metrics and all of that back into the system so that we then run things like hourly roll-ups of you know, GC pauses and all of that kind of stuff. And there's Kibana dashboards for those. Uh, in there, though, I have this average word count by author, or sorry, average commit length by author. Uh, the definition of that is right here. If we look at the body, and you can see it's pretty simple JSON. You give it a unique ID. You tell it what fields you want to group on. You tell it the query of what documents you want to select. And then you have a whole bunch of mathematical operations at your fingertips where you can do things like means and, and standard deviations and co-occurrence analysis and slicing and dicing of the data. And then uh, you have various other parameters that you can put in. And all these aggregations then do is just get fed back into a collection back in solar. So if we come back to this, I run this in the background. Uh, actually, let me just show that real quick. The running these aggregations is as simple as just posting to that ID. 
and that thing will go and run. You can also hook it into our scheduler and say, hey, run this every hour, every whatever, right? So what does that all then look like? Well, these are all just solar documents, right? So come back in here. Uh, you can see this is our aggregations index. Um, I've got a few other aggregations in here, but so here's some example documents of average commit length by author. Uh, this one happens to be mine. Uh, and so you can see in this particular project, uh, I've got my user ID down here that I was uh, rolling up on. Uh, my average commit size for this project was 92 uh, uh, characters, right? So uh, not a lot, not a real heavy committer on this particular project. Whereas if I were to run this on some others, you would see different stats for different people. And of course, this is just one particular view. You can go and build you know, the, the dashboards and all of that kind of stuff uh, for managing that, right? So that's a quick and uh, dirty tour of Fusion, and I think some of the ways you can use this. Like I said, we're doing uh, a lot more of this underneath the hood. I'm not sure why that doesn't remember where I'm at. But uh, as far as next steps, a couple of interesting things going on. I've been slowly but surely working on, if you're familiar with the Open Grok project, they have a whole ton of Lucene or a whole ton of Lucene analyzers for different source languages. I've started a project to extract those out because I'm not exactly an open grok. Uh, I don't like the open grok license, but they've got a lot of good stuff underneath the hood there. It doesn't fully compile yet. I have pushed how far I've gotten. There's like a couple of compile issues left. Uh, but then from that, I think we'll have a nice standalone suite of analyzers for Lucene for, you know, I think there's like 30 or 40 different languages plus uh, it knows about like GitHub and SVN and all of that kind of stuff. So that's pretty good. Uh, I've also started, and I'm not ready to publish this yet, but uh, we use FindBugs, for instance, a lot. We use uh, Emma and Karma for code coverage. Those all produce similar kinds of things. Uh, I think FindBugs will work really nicely as a stage in our pipeline. So as that code's flowing through, you can run FindBugs, and then that will create a lot of those attributes, so you can search across those. Uh, thinking about the bigger picture, there's some really interesting things I think you could do around combining static and real-time analysis. You've got all this great log data flowing in back into Fusion. You're doing your standard Kibana alerting and visualization off of uh, your logs. Well, what happens now if you have your logs totally in sync with your code base and the developers who are writing it and the developers who are talking about it? Right, that's really powerful, I think. And so I think we're gonna do some interesting things there. Other things we're thinking and, and doing and working on is uh, how do we integrate this into the broader infrastructure of our company in terms of you know, relating it to what customers are doing, uh, relating it to what's happening out in social media and all of that kind of stuff. So if you want more info, that's where uh, you can go download Fusion. Uh, we publish a bunch of examples just up in, in that GitHub URL. All of this stuff is under there. Uh, otherwise, happy to take, a, I think we got time for a couple of questions. Yeah. So the question was, is can we set up in the query pipelines, you know, some kind of intelligent set of rules around where the user is in the workflow or in the process, right? Is that a fair? Yeah, so, yeah, what, what have you seen when you do that? Yep. So in uh, 2.1, we released what we call, uh, it's not a great name, but we call like our hierarchical rule capabilities, essentially taxonomy. But at you have this full taxon taxonomic capability. And off any category, you can hang a set of uh, solar parameters such that when a request comes in, you, you pass in, you say, here's where I'm at in my navigation. It goes and looks up in the taxonomy and says, oh, I want to apply these facets. I want to apply these filters. I want to do this alerting. I want to do these downstream operations. It injects those kinds of things into the uh, rest of the pipeline and then goes and queries solar. Uh, I believe in 2.2, which is coming up, we'll have a whole UI for all of that stuff as well and, and uh, API. So right now it's underneath the hood in terms of uh, interacting with it. But it, there again is a place where we just store all that taxonomy in solar 
and then query it and load it up and all of that. Uh, maybe one more question? Anyone? No? Yep. So, next to the uh, search thing for internal deployment, in the internal third party app, how are they calling the pipeline? Do they segment pipeline or are you modifying source of data for your uh, No, you, so you call the pipelines present themselves as endpoint APIs. In fact, SolarJ works with them if you want to just point SolarJ at our endpoints. Otherwise, it's, you know, you can just curl them or like what I'm doing with Postman there is just straight, you know, JSON over HTTP. Um, you can, there's kind of two levels there. We have, you can call a pipeline specifically if you want, but you can also call what we call a query profile, which is essentially a pointer to a pipeline. And so that allows you then, what you can do is you can imagine setting up multiple different pipelines that all kind of do similar things, but you're not sure which one, you know, you might want to change you know, you're making changes, you want to try them out. You don't have to change your code. You just have your code point at the profile. And then in the admin or in your tooling, you change which pipeline it is underneath the hood. That gets hot deployed across the cluster all uh, dynamically, right? So instead, you know, like in solar, you'd have to change your request handler and all that kind of stuff. This takes away uh, that kind of stuff from, you know, you don't have to do that. You don't have to redeploy solar, you know, reload a, a core or any of that. Yeah, so I think, you know, that's where, like, the open grok stuff comes in. I think the, the question was what special processing around the code. I don't have any of that hooked in yet. That's where that open grok piece is going to come in. And that does, a, that does a lot, has a lot more knowledge, obviously, about a language and building up, uh, you know, syntax trees and all that kind of stuff. Um, so with that, uh, I'll be around. I know, I know I'm between you and lunch. Just want to thank you for your time and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>